Welcome to CMI School of Christ. This is the Revelation of Christ. I think this is session eight. We're going to call this uh, Possess Ye Your Souls. We left off in sharing about how Jesus is an anchor for the soul, fixed within the veil. That's said in Hebrews 6, verse 19. If you remember, we were looking at how when we see the Lord, His presence causes us to let go of all of our other anchors. Anchors that we've fixed in the world. These are external things that we've put our trust in instead of Christ Himself. The verse that's in my heart when I think about these things is, uh, we fix not our eyes on things that are seen, but things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporal, and the things that are unseen are eternal. And that's, and that's, and that's Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, who is... The eternal spirit, he is not seen, not with natural eyes. He is seen in our souls and the experience within our heart by the revelation of Christ. But these are the things that are not Christ. These other anchors, they're external things that we put our trust in. Our own righteousness, our own familiar paths or rituals. It could be our strengths and talents that we would like to believe is Christ in us. It can be the false security of experiencing God work in our natural circumstances. A false anchor can be the things that we do for the kingdom with natural energies. Or perhaps a confidence that we have from our own victories over our vices or filthiness of the flesh. And these, that victory falls short of the goal. And if our confidence falls from our confidence in God to self-confidence, then that confidence is something that has to be shaken by the Spirit and taken away. Remember that the very self-life of the soul is among the first things that we have to let go of in the face of Christ. But the taking away is never the goal. It's not the end. Knowing Jesus is the eternal focus. Ephesians 3.19 says, To know the surpassing knowledge of the love of God, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I suppose that could be another title for this whole session, is being filled with the fullness of God. Being found... And in being found in Christ, the natural life of the soul is lost. In John 12, 25 and 26, Jesus said, He that loves his life, and the word there in the Greek is psyche, he who loves his psyche, his soul, shall lose it. And he who hates his soul in this world shall keep it to eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am... There shall also my servant be. So what part of the soul is lost and is dead? What part of the soul is restored and filled with resurrection life? May the Lord impart His understanding in this. We're talking about how we died with Christ when we're buried with Him in His burial and how the church is now risen out from among the dead in Christ. May you know this is more than just a teaching. But let it be the knowing of Jesus in His death and resurrection. May you experience His presence and glory in the fullness of His purpose and intention. You are His house, and He lives in His house. His eternal life fills the Father's house entirely. The only way we can know this is to see it finished in Him. May He be magnified in His body by His appearing. May we hear this great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and He will dwell in them and they shall be His people and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Revelation 21.3 
And so I want to show you the testimony of Jesus in the tabernacle and some of the pieces there. Um, I just want to submit to you and ask you, submit this view to you and ask you to consider it prayerfully. Um, it's, a vo- it's a view of spirit, soul, and body in the, in the tabernacle, in the testimony. Um, as I've shared in many places, the tabernacle is three parts. It's spirit. I believe the, the Holy of Holies represents the spirit, that the holy place represents the soul, that the outer court represents the body. Not just your body, but I am persuaded that only Christ himself is spirit, soul, body, and that Adam was made a living soul. Let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Young's literal reads, May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved unblameable in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Young's literal translation. I like it because it is faithful to the original Greek language. When it says that you are made blameless and whole in the coming of Christ. Translators often wrongly interpret this verse for us. They change the preposition to be in accord with a future understanding of the coming of Christ. Some read, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the English Standard Version. Or they'll use when, or unto, or until. All these words suggest a future unfulfilled event. Other interpreters will put the responsibility responsibility squarely on your shoulders. The ISV reads, Remain blameless when our Lord Jesus the Messiah appears. See, but the word in, like like I read here in in, uh, Young's Literal, is the right translation of this Greek proposition. I'm sorry, preposition. The Greek word preposition is in, which Thayer's properly offers in, by, or with as English synonyms. <clears throat> there is no unto or until. It's not the proper definition of this Greek word. What a hindrance it is whenever man's understanding adds or takes away from the work of Christ. Look at how the natural mind satisfies its understanding by altering just one word of Scripture, effectively postponing the presence of Christ in you. The point is that it is His coming and His presence in you that is your sanctification. By the coming of Christ or through the coming of Christ, it would express this well enough, but I prefer in... And so I've written here in the English literal translation, and may the God of peace, I'm sorry, the, may, and may God of the peace himself sanctify you complete, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is to say, it's through the instrumentality of the presence of Christ that you are made sanctified. It's Him in you. It's in His presence, in His coming, that you have sanctification. And this is said in other scriptures. For example, uh, Colossians 1.30 says, Of Him are you in Christ Jesus. Same Greek preposition. 200 times it says you're in Christ. You can't take this preposition and say, of him are you at Christ? Um, are, are, of him are you until Christ? Those, those, that is to tw- twist Paul's original meaning. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, 
who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. Do you see how? It is Christ in you who is your sanctification. You are sanctified because of His presence in you. There's another word I want to bring into focus and cause you to fix your attention on in this. By Him you are kept blameless. It's this, this word here, the Greek word behind kept is Strong's 508. And it's pronounced tarot. Uh, Thayer suggests that the definition is to guard or uh, to keep one in the state in which he is in. So uh, Young used the word preserved. Young says that in his coming you are preserved, unblameable. So in this blessing, Paul is telling the church that the appearing of Christ in you, when, when, when the coming of Christ is seen, it makes it apparent that you have already been in a state of blamelessness. Already in a state of wholeness. You were already in a state of completeness. It's just that your soul has now been made to comprehend the state that you were already in. And so it's written that you may be kept blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When a child appears in birth, it's then that the mother fully comprehends the state she was already in. Has she been made more complete? Not really. But in the appearing of the Son... The father and mother witness the true evidence of the pregnancy, the morning sickness, and all the uncertainty of his coming has now been removed. The joy has come that a new man is born into the world. It's from this understanding that Paul writes, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Galatians 4.19 as we've, I've shared about the tabernacle many times, uh, but until now I've looked at deta in detail about the divide between the soul and the spirit. And, uh, and I've made a clear teaching about how the first man, soulish Adam, was represented in as a soul and body. And the second man, the new man, spiritual man himself, that is Jesus Christ alone, is spirit, soul, and body. And you are only spirit, soul, and body as the spirit of Christ fills your heart through spiritual birth. But in all these things, the taber in the tabernacle, the tabernacle, the tabernacle is not a testimony of you. It's a testimony of Jesus. And if you go to the the uh, testimony looking for yourself, you will be deceived. And you'll find yourself heavily burdened. I'm telling you, if, if the Lord teaches us by His Holy Spirit, you will see Christ. And yes, you will see people, uh, people uh, maybe many, that are in Christ, as it's written, when Christ who is our life appears, we shall appear with Him in glory. Because, but you only see God's people as His body and as a, as a vessel of His increase. And it's the increase of Christ. It's God's house. God lives in the house. We haven't looked enough at the Scriptures that show the very soul of Jesus filling this new creation spirit, soul, body. And so let's look at how the Word of God declares that not only does the Spirit of Jesus inhabit the center or the core of His people as the Spirit, but He fills His house completely. The presence of Jesus Christ lives in His church, spirit, soul, and body. Nothing of man ministers in His presence. Philippians Chapter 1, verse 27. I'm reading Young's literal translation. <clears throat> Paul writes, Worthily 
of the good news and of, the, and of Christ conduct you yourselves. That whether having come and seen you, whether being absent I may hear the things concerning you, that you stand fast in one spirit, now listen to this, with one soul, striving together for the faith of the good news. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, Young's literal says, Fulfill you my joy, that ye may mind the same thing, having the same love of one soul. Minding the one thing. The one soul is Jesus Christ. It's the life of the Spirit filling the soul, animating the soul. We're looking unto Jesus Himself. We read about having the mind of the Spirit. Romans 8.27 says the mind of the Spirit. And that we are renewed in the Spirit of your mind. That's, that's uh, Ephesians 4.23. See, the mind is a function of the soul, and it's filled, animated, and taught by the anointing. This is His glory, filling His house. In the church, what, what is His? All. Um, what I'm, what I'm, I've, I've been teaching that the outer court has a place where there's a baptism, uh, there's a laver there, and there's an altar there where the flesh of animals are consumed and those things, and the washings there, I believe that, are, that are, are in regard, they're external things, that they are things of the body, and that in the holy place you have, uh, what I've write, written on the board, it's in the, in the tabernacle of Moses, you had a lampstand, a table of showbread, and the golden altar of incense. And then there was a veil, and behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant. Now within the Ark of the Covenant was a golden bowl of manna. That's what I've drawn here. And uh, Aaron's rod that budded. And the stone tablets, the second set of stone tablets. The first were broken, and the second covenant, if you will, written, was placed within. All these things were within the... Ark of the Covenant. And I'm suggesting to you that the things in the Holy of Holies represent a mind, will, and emotions. These are part of the soul. I'd say that the holy place represents the things of the soul, and the Holy of Holies represents the Spirit. And so, in the tabernacle of Moses, you had a testimony of Jesus, the only man who was spirit, soul, and body. And throughout the history of Israel, at the time of the beginning of the book of Samuel, at the end of the, the time of Judges, and just at the beginning of the time of the Kings, the Ark of the Covenant was lost. And it was lost to the Philistines. And that house was pronounced Ichabod. The glory had departed from that house. That was, at, I think it was at Shiloh at the time. Um, but the point that I've made many times is that the house, while it was in that condition, was only... Uh, soul and body. It was under the condition, un, in that condition for 40 years during the administration of Saul. And so Saul comes to represent the soulish man. And the tabernacle is in the same condition, just soul and body, a soulish man. While the part that is the Holy of Holies, the, the Ark of the Covenant, had been removed. And so the glory of God was with the Ark of the Covenant. 
And in David's generation, which was he reigned 40 years, David reigned over Judah for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, he brought the Ark of the Covenant up to Zion, where he parked the Ark of the Covenant in his, in his backyard. And they worshipped Yahweh without a veil and without any of the trappings of the tabernacle of Moses. And they worshipped for 33 years. And so that tabernacle of David, I believe, comes to represent a second day. The first was the Ichabod house represents death and the man of death and the day of his death, Christ's death. And the second house represents burial and it represents Jesus of Nazareth himself who walked the earth 33 years. And at the end of that time, that house, that tabernacle of David was torn down. And so the, the Ark of the Covenant comes to be placed in an entirely new house. It is the same Ark of the Covenant that fills this new creation because it's the same Jesus who died and rose again that fills the body of His resurrection. It's the church. It's a spiritual body. It's a spiritual house. And in that house, everything's bigger. The Holy of Holies is ten times bigger. There's ten lampstands. There's ten tables of showbread. <coughs> and if this house of increase, if this Solomon's temple is a testimony of the resurrection man, the new man, then there's many hearts, many souls that are filled with the glory of Jesus Christ. And so I've said that that's, that's what the, the many souls and the many parts of the soul represent. And uh, I've just felt like that, you know, to stop there, it falls short of, well, I, I'll, I'll say this, it could be misunderstood or misconstrued that I say that, the, that I believe that the, that the presence of Christ, the coming of Christ, fills the part of your heart that is the Spirit. But He doesn't fill the soul. But He doesn't fill the house completely. He, he doesn't animate. But He does. And that's what these verses say. And I believe that these things, that this... This one soul filling his house is, is, uh, is represented and testified of in these things that are within the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> outside of the veil, outside of the Holy of Holies, there was a table. And the table of showbread... The showbread was baked by man. Every Sabbath it was placed before the veil. But it was made by man and it got stale and had to be replaced. The, uh, the lampstand was a, was a sculpture of an almond tree. And it had to be filled with oil regularly so that it could give light. It had to be refilled. It got empty. It had to be refilled. And, and in, inside the Ark of the Covenant, there was bread, but it was not man-made. And so these, th these things are the things of God. And um, that's the... 
that's the, the uh, testimony that I see represented in, in these things. Aaron's rod that budded, was an, it, was a, it was a branch from an almond tree. And when it was set within the tabernacle, it budded, it flowered, it bore fruit, it had almonds on it. Can you see how this is a, this is a man-made sculpture, an imitation of an almond tree? And this one is a, an almond tree that God Himself raised from the dead. It was dead, and then it was restored to life. This, the tablets, the stone tablets that were within, they were written by the finger of God. Moses did not write the words on the stone tablet. I believe that, that you know, people that study the soul... They, soul that, they say that the soul has three functions. A mind, your mind thinks. It has ideas. Your will chooses, makes choices. Your emotions has feelings and passions. <clears throat> I, I believe that, the, that these things correlate to the one soul that the church is an expression of is the passions of Christ, the will of God, the mind of Christ, having expression in a people, having animating God's people. And if you see that, you know, the way that this whole thing is set up is, is these things come out from that which represents the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is sufficient. It has, it has sufficiency for all these things. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6 says that we have the mind of Christ. We lean not on our own understanding. <clears throat> In Philippians 2, 13, it says that God is at work in you, both to will and to do His good pleasure. And so I'm saying this, this represents the will of God. And um, it's, it's hard to find a, a verse that talks about the emotions of Christ. But um, if, you, if you look at the Greek word behind the sufferings of Christ, um, you'll find that in Greek that this, this word um, is used for his passions that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings is Philippians 3 verse 10 this is <clears throat> I, I, I wouldn't call the peace of God an emotion but it you understand that it surpasses it surpasses our comprehension. It's, it's, the, it's a piece that passes our, surpasses our understanding. It, it fills and overthrows the soul of man. What, what is the divide between these things that are of man and the things that are of God? Well, it's a veil. The soul that has not seen Christ unveiled within is a soul that will be an imitation of the things of God. And it will get burnt out. It will need refilled. It will become weary and heavy laden and search for rest. See, there's, I just don't know how any other way to, sh to, to share about these invisible things except showing you how God has depicted them in the tabernacle. Um, 
So this house is, it's God's people. How many times is that said in the scriptures? This house is God living in a people. Hebrew says, Moses truly was faithful in all his house, ministering as a servant for a testimony of the things having been spoken. But Christ is a son over his house, whose house we are. I'm highlighting that part. If truly we hold fast to the boldness and the rejoicing and hope firm to the end. That's Hebrews 3, 5. And of course, Paul puts it plainly in Corinthians. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3, 16. He shows the fulfillment of the veil is found within the hearts of even unbelievers. In uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 14 through 16, he says, he's talking about the Jews, he says, their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only in Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, Whenever Moses is, Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. So Paul's telling us plainly that the veil that was in the house of God is fulfilled in the blindness of the unbelieving. A veil remains over their hearts. It's in, it's in the heart. And when it says that whenever a heart turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So the division between soul and spirit is removed. This is revelation. This is when the soul begins to experience the things of the spirit. And so the spirit of Christ fills the soul, possessing that which is his own. Look at how the spirit of Christ in you was represented within the veil as the holy of holies. He is the spirit in his body, the church. Jesus himself said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. The reason I'm quoting you this verse in in John 4, verse 18, is Jesus is plainly talking about the promise of the Spirit coming. And then He tells us that He is it. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Paul tells us the same thing there. Going back to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now the Lord is that Spirit. He's talking about the Lord Jesus. Um, this is hard to accept when we, when we uh, well, I'll, I'll say with the, the mind of man in all our Trinitarian views, we, and we've got God divided up in three persons. But in His appearing, we see that God is one. I don't know, y'all, if you want to, if you really struggle with this, um, water is one thing. It has three different manifestations. You got liquid gas and then a solid when the white stuff comes down. I'm just, I'm just saying that Jesus is plain in John chapter 14. When Philip says, "If just show us the Father, that will be enough for us. Have I been with you so long? And you have not known me, Philip? And then when he talks about the Spirit, I, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I'm telling you that this is Christ in you, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, they're not separate persons. It is God. It is Yahweh as the Father, manifest as the Son, present in you and come in you by His Spirit. And His Spirit is God's covenant. It is the new covenant. No, it's not a human spirit made holy. 
It is the presence of God. God is spirit. And true worshipers must worship Him in spirit and truth. That is, that is only received by spiritual birth. And that spiritual birth is only come to fullness and fulfillment in the appearing of Christ in you. Not only is uh, that temple a people filled with Christ, that temple is just, it is Jesus. It's a new man. In John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And the one believing into me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he said concerning the Spirit, whom the ones believing into him were about to receive. I'm quoting the uh, LITV. That's Jay Green's translation. And uh, if you've ever read that translation very much, um, they've done a great job. Whenever a, <clears throat> a verse out of the Old Testament is quoted, they give you the reference to it almost every time. But when Jesus says, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, this particular translation says no Old Testament passage. And that's because if you search the Old Testament, you're not going to find a direct quote in the Old Testament that says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. See, this is wonderful here because Jesus is paraphrasing for us. And in his paraphrasing of certain Old Testament passages, he is telling us his interpretation of them. And it's, it's uh, oh, it's radical. <laughs> uh, it shoots dispensational ideas right in the head of Ezekiel's tab, the temple in Ezekiel and things. Let me, let me go into that. I want, I, I, want to, I, want to just, I want to just read to you which Old Testament scriptures Jesus is paraphrasing. He's more than just paraphrasing. He's interpreting the prophets for us. He is commenting. Now, this is, this is the kind of commentary you, you need to embrace. Jesus is telling us that the new covenant fulfillment of these prophecies is all about the Spirit, whom the ones believing in Him were about to receive within them. In Zechariah, Chapter 14, verses 7 through 9, it says, And there has been one day known to Yahweh, not day nor night, and it comes that at that time of evening there is light. And it has come to pass in that day that living waters shall flow forth from Jerusalem. Half of them to the eastern sea, that's the Dead Sea, and half to the latter sea, that's the Western Sea is the Mediterranean, the Great Sea. <clears throat> in summer and in winter it shall be. Then Yahweh is king over the land. In that day Yahweh is one, and his name is one. In Ezekiel, we also have a, 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 a reference to living waters. It's in chapter 47. He brought me back to the door of the house. Behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house. Okay, so the, the living water has just, just come from Jerusalem. It comes specifically from the temple. Who you are. For in front of the house, the front of the house faced east, and the water was flowing down from under the right side of the house, south of the altar. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate, and he led me around outside by the way to the outer, outer, outer gate, <clears throat> the way of the gate looking east. And behold, water was trickling out from the right side. And when man went out eastward with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits, and he led me to the water, and the water was as deep as my ankles. 
And again, he measured out a thousand. And he led me to the water, and the water was to my knees. And again, he measured a thousand, and he led me to, into the water, and the water was up to the waist. And he measured a thousand. And now it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen, water to swim in, a river that could not be crossed. And he said to me, have you seen this, son of man? And he brought me back to the bank of the river. And when he had retor- returned, behold, there was very many trees on one side and along the bank of the river. And he said to me, these waters go out toward the eastern region. We're, he's talking about desert. If you've been to Israel, east is towards the Dead Sea. And every, there's no, not hardly any trees there. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a region parched and thirsty and dry. And the, and the sea is the dead sea in which there is no fish. And the waters are dead, not living waters. Do you understand? <clears throat> so he's describing a river flowing out with all kinds of life flourishing. And as they go down, they go down to the Arabah <clears throat> and enter the sea. And so if you have been to Israel, you would know that the the Dead Sea is to the east of Jerusalem and that if it were to be overflown, overflowing with water, it would flow south and come out at Elot in the Red Sea. It would flow down into that sea. And when they arrive at the sea, the waters of the sea will flow and become fresh. And it will be the ever-living creature that swarms there will live wherever the rivers go. It doesn't directly say that the, that the waters are living waters. It says that the waters will flow there and bring life. And there will be a great multitude of fish because of the water that goes there and makes the salt water fresh. And so everything will be healed and live wherever the river goes. And fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to, to En Galim. And it will be a place for the spreading of their nets. If you've ever been to En Gedi, it's in the middle of the desert. There is no water there, very little, only when it rains in, in the spring in the, and in the fall. There is a, a small refuge there where there's some green plants growing, but, but the description here is of water flowing out from the sanctuary and its fruit will be for food and its leaf will be for healing. This is all from Ezekiel 47. Now dispensationalists will uh, interpret this for us and say that this house, this temple will be fulfilled in an external, literal way where you're going to see A new temple built, a third temple in, it's going to be Ezekiel's temple, and it's going to be built in Jerusalem, it's going to be so big, it's going to be big as Europe. Um, But that is not Jesus' interpretation of this, do you understand? Jesus sees the fulfillment of these prophecies as as the coming of the Spirit in God's people, and the living waters... Jesus understands that they are the Spirit flowing out from your belly, out from your core. If literalist understood Jesus' meaning, he would probably accuse Jesus of spiritualizing the Scriptures. But this excerpt is just an example of the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ declares that Jesus himself fulfilled the death and resurrection of the temple in three days. Jesus said to them, destroy this sanctuary and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, this sanctuary was, took 46 years for it to be built. And you think you can raise it up in three days. But he spoke this about the sanctuary of his body. We're in John chapter 2, verse 19 and 21. The body of Christ Filled with the Spirit of God is the fulfillment of these prophecies. And so let's go to the book of Hebrews. 
And let's look at how the things of the Old Covenant declare this. This has always been the Lord's using tangible things to illustrate spiritual and eternal realities. These, these, these temples, these lands, they all spoke the, the promised land is God's promise that He would give you a place to live. And we understand that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of your place to live. He is the fulfillment of your temple, whose house you are. And so the writer of Hebrews is, takes us to the temple and he starts to talk to us about these things. And on the first tabernacle, still having been standing, which was a parable for the present time. Hebrews 9.9. 9. The uh, English Standard Version says that the first tabernacle was a parable or a symbolic for the present age, which is now the new covenant. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to start right there to tell you that this is a parable. about the coming of Christ in His body, the church. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection and about the three days. Okay, so the writer of Hebrews says, truly, the, then the first covenant had also ordinances of service. An earthly place, and the first tabernacle was prepared, which, which there was both a lampstand and the table for the setting out of loaves, which, is, which are called holy, the table of showbread. But the, behind the second veil is a tabernacle. See, he describes it like it's another house, another man, being called holy of holies, having the gold, golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered round about on all sides with gold, in which was a golden pot, having manna and Aaron's rod that budded in the ta tablets of the covenant, and above it, the cherubims of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat, about which now there's not enough time to speak piece by piece. I was going to tell you, we have time now. <laughs> so we're going to reverse it. We're going to review this furniture of tabernacle piece by piece, but I'm running out of time. Uh, so we'll just have to continue this lesson next time, because we're only going to do an hour. And these... Having been prepared thus, the priests go into the first tabernacle through all, completing the services, but into the second, the high priest alone goes. Once a year, not without blood, which he offers, offers for himself and for the ignorance of the people. The Holy Spirit signifying by this that the way of the Holy of Holies had not yet been made manifest. The first tabernacle still having been, having been standing which was a parable for the present time, according to both which gifts and services are offered, but as regards the conscience, not being able to perfect the one serving. The implication is that this new house, made not with hands, is well able to perfect the one serving. Because you're perfect in Christ. <clears throat> It was not able to perfect the one serving, but only foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances until the time of the Reformation or the times of setting things right has been imposed. But Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is, not of this creation. I love that because it, 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 it tells me that the, the body of Christ, the resurrection house, is the new creation. The first house and the things outside the veil was represented by the first kingdom and it was ruled by the natural soulish man, Adam. It was represented by Saul. 
And the second house, and the Holy of Holies, that became the tabernacle of David, are, were represented by David. And Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of him. He's our true David. He shall reign forever. <clears throat> this is the kingdom of God. And by the work You've, by the work of the cross, you've been translated out from the first and into the second. It's the Spirit who is speaking of the new covenant when he writes, now I'm in Ezekiel 37. One king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more be two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned. <clears throat> and will cleanse them, and so they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd, and they shall walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes and do them. Now, Zechariah also describes this. See, see, Ezekiel is talking about the new covenant here. So is Zechariah. It's... If you read Zechariah, it's all one thought. One day, in that day, in that day, in that day. He's not talking about a different day in Zechariah chapter 12 than he is in Zechariah chapter 14. He talks about the church. He describes them as the house of David. They shall mourn for him when they look on him who they pierced. Zechariah calls it the day of the Lord. He talks about the living waters flowing. He talks about a fountain being opened for the house of David. These are, these are, this is all God taking things that were natural things, natural kingdoms, natural kings, tangible houses, things made with hands, things you can touch. And he was, and, and he was taking that whole language and saying, this is it. It's in my son. The church is the house of David. The church is a new Jerusalem. The church is a temple from which waters flow. He's not describing re, a recreating of a new temple. He is, he is describing a people that are the fulfillment of the old. Not only does the veil separate two men, it's the judgment. And as we have already done, we've, we see how the, the two houses are separated. The outer court and the holy place of the tabernacle of Moses were shed when the Holy of Holies was separated from it when the, when the Ark of the Covenant was removed from it and was carried up to Zion. It was as if the whole tabernacle of Moses was a husk and a shell of a seed that was peeled away, put off. And so Christ put off the soul and body of the whole old creation. And he, as the Spirit of God, a Spirit who is sufficient, having all the things of one soul in itself, the seed of God, the heart, the meat of that seed, fell into the ground and died. And it bore much fruit, and it bore increase. Of Christ. This is, this is the work of Christ. Many of the first were last, and many of the last became first.
and it's a great testimony. Uh, then it's 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 a it's a far greater testimony than I have time to share from, but. It is sufficient to say that that when the Spirit of God comes into you by new birth, that He is there to be unveiled. He is there to be revealed. And when, and when that veil is taken away in your heart, your soul sees the Spirit of Christ. And no man can see the Lord and live. And those words begin to be understood. Your death with Christ was was fulfilled on the cross 2,000 years ago. But as your soul begins to experience the unveiling of Jesus Christ and the removing of this blindness and this veil, and and your soul begins to comprehend and see Christ By the revelation from the Holy Spirit, you begin to understand and participate in His death. Just like when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back to Israel and they pried it open and looked inside, 3,000 people died. No man can see the Lord and live. When the veil is rent, you see Life. Eternal life. Not soulish life. Not the, the, the life that God breathed into the nostrils of men, of Adam, and of animals. That doesn't qualify as life. When you see life, spiritual life, you see there is no other life except Christ. So when Christ, who is our life, appears... We appear with Him in glory. And it's a house that has one body. It's the church. It's a house that has one spirit. It is Christ in you. And it's a house that's being filled. Though though there are many souls there, there are many hearts, there are are many dwelling places, it's a house that's filled with one soul. And it's Christ Himself living in that people. It's His will at work in you. Not the, work, not the will of man, but the will of God. It is the mind of Christ being revealed in you. And there's no invention of man's heart. It is His very passions that you're having fellowship with. When I read, that I may know Him and the fellowship of His sufferings, That word there, sufferings, is not not Paul wanting to experience sufferings in his circumstances. It's Paul wanting to experience the resurrection life of Christ filling his soul, overwhelming his soul with the presence of Jesus. And that's what he means by the fellowship of his passions. You need not go out and look for rejection or persecutions to know fellowship with his sufferings. This is something that happens deep within. And it happens by the revelation of Christ. And we're out of time, so I think that's a good stopping point. Um, uh, I thank you for contacting me at uh, Daniel underscore Edward underscore Brown at yahoo.com I appreciate your, your emails and uh, and your comments and, uh, and that's a good stopping point I hope these sharings are a blessing to you we'll, we'll continue on with this